Hey everyone, this is Russ Altman, the host of The Future of Everything. Today we're rerunning a fascinating conversation I had with Jen and Bao back in 2017. It's about the work she and her lab are doing to develop artificial skin. The possible applications of a material that could replicate properties of skin range from restoring a sense of touch for amputees to creating bendable electronics. Thanks for listening in and we hope you enjoy this episode from the archives. Before we jump into this podcast, let me ask you to please rate and review it. It helps us improve and it helps spread the word about the future of everything. Materials are not really what they used to be. And in fact, increasingly, we are seeing materials that are trying to capture features of skin and other materials that you never would imagine could be possible. While also providing protection, they're also giving us the opportunity of integrating these materials into our electronic world. So what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, let's think about skin for a second. Skin, as we learn in medical school, which I did attend, counts as an organ, first of all. It's an organ. It's the largest organ by weight. It's critical for temperature control, for water and evaporation control, but it's really famous because of its senses. It senses touch cold and heat, pain, pressure, and other things. And in fact, the biology of how that happens is quite amazing. There are small protein channels that are electrically active, and when they feel the thing that they're supposed to sense, pressure, heat, pain, they fire. And they, that, those, those, that firing goes up your neurons into your brain, and your brain responds. The other thing about skin is it heals. We've all cut ourselves. We've all seen it, the miracle of healing skin. So the functions of skin are currently not captured in artificial limbs, for example. People with artificial limbs do not feel the sense of any of the senses. They do not heal. And so really they have to rely on their other senses to understand what's happening with those limbs. They have to look at it or they have to have the parts of their body that has skin kind of infer what might be happening in the artificial artificial limb. But my guest today is trying to change some or all of that. Dr. Janen Bao of Stanford Department of Material Science is creating new materials that can sense pressure, heal themselves after in- injury, and even interface with electronic devices. Janen, why are you focusing on artificial skin, and is this really within reach? Well, um, artificial skin is really a representation of the future of electronics. It's trying to capture the um, uh, our imagination in terms of uh, building the future electronics uh, so that they looks like skin, feels like skin, and can allow amputees to regain their sense of feeling. But also, if we use such materials to build our future electronics, uh, we can, for example, fold our cell phones and uh, put in our pocket, and uh, we may even make our skin to be able to, to see or listen. That's amazing to even think about. And I get the sense that you see our current world and that you're impatient and you see possibilities far beyond what we're currently being able to do. Tell me how we could possibly have a piece of skin made by humans feel pressure. So the the material we're using uh, are plastic materials, uh, elastic materials. When they are sandwiched between electrodes, uh, they can change shape if you apply a pressure. And the shape change can give rise to an electrical signal change, which we can detect. And if we make them very, very small and uh, similar size as our biological mechanoreceptors, then you can imagine that we can make them into similar density as um, our skin mechanoreceptor density. Let's go into a little bit more detail. So we have a plastic material that, of course, bends, and we we know about plastics. But uh, as I understand it, you've embedded in that plastic material some um, compounds that can conduct electricity. Yes. And, And what is it that happens that turns the signal on or off 
based on the experiencing pressure? There are several ways we can do this. Um, in one case, simply the um, elastic material in between the conductive material can change its ability to hold charges. So that's called capacitance. Uh -huh. uh, it can change with pressure, then we can measure it. Or alternatively, a conductive material can also change its own conduction based on the pressure, and we can measure that. So tell me if I got this right. I apply a pressure to my little plastic magic material, and perhaps some molecules align in such a way that electrons that weren't able to flow previously now can flow more easily, and so I get a spike of some kind in my electrical signal. And when I let go of the pressure, those molecules are not aligned in the right way, and so the electrons, the electricity, that is, can no longer flow. Is that roughly what we're talking about? Uh, that's, that's one mechanism. Uh, in our case, uh, there are cases where it's as simple as mixing carbon conductive particles with a rubber material. So when you uh, apply a pressure, the carbon particles get closer to each other and the conduction would increase. Okay, so you mentioned uh, cell phones that fold. That caught my attention. And I don't think you're meaning flip, flip phones. Is that going to be some of the earliest applications of these materials? What do you see as the path to getting this uh, into the most affecting the most lives? The uh, cell phones that can fold, basically those are the, uh, going to be the early generation of uh, uh, the application for artificial skin. Uh, basically, uh, the uh, hinges for the foldable phones are going to be made with uh, stretchable electronic materials uh, that are, uh, are similar to artificial skin. Uh, and then the uh, next application we see are applications uh, where uh, these uh, electronic sensors uh, may be put onto um, uh, the uh, prosthetic uh, limb uh, yes. to help to regain uh, the sense of feel uh, for amputees. So if I can fold my cell phone, just thinking it, just thinking about it, first of all, it can be very thin, I would guess. And also, you might be able to give me a much bigger cell phone with like a keyboard and a 10-inch monitor. Uh, and is that the kind of thing that we might be able to look forward to? Uh, yes, certainly. Yeah. When can I buy this? <laughs> uh, you may see the earlier version of this um, uh, maybe as soon as uh, later this year or sometime next year. There are uh, cell phone companies uh, talking about putting this uh, onto the market. But of course, the uh, the whole cell phone itself is still rigid, uh, but it will have a, the possibility to, to fold yes. a large screen into half of its size. Are we able to put the kinds of lighting that goes into televisions like LC? LEDs and LEDs, are we ab able to embed those in these kinds of materials as well? Uh, yes, yes, that's possible. I've also heard about some of these materials can be painted. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what's the idea of, of paint? What, why would we want to paint something? Yeah, so, so these materials, uh, since they're mostly made of um, plastics, uh, we can dissolve them into different kinds of organic solvents or uh, make them into nanoparticles so that they can be dispersed in liquid. And if we're able to paint them, then that means we can uh, coat the material over very large large area and coat onto uh, flexible plastic substrates and even on garments uh, that you talked about earlier. So this creates new possibilities uh, for building electronics. So these would be wiring systems that can be bent. Um, are they very robust to bending? Like, can I like fold them yeah, pretty they, hard? They, uh, they, they are not only bendable, but also stretchable. You can stretch them like our skin uh, on the uh, elbow, the skin stretch right. almost uh, 50 percent uh, when, when we bend our elbow. So these materials, uh, uh, the new generation of materials that we are developing, they can uh, stretch twice its original length without losing its high conductivity. So going back to my initial comments about the Fashion Institute of Technology, it does sound like these might find their way into clothing. And I could imagine applications of this, uh, I don't know, in the exercise industry, so we could know what's going on as I move, how much I'm moving, or what my heart rate is. Are these on the horizon? 
Yes, definitely. Yeah, you can imagine having uh, sensors may, that may analyze your sweat while you're exercising. If we can put uh, the uh, electronics uh, that feels like skin on the garment. You know, we've had another guest who was talking about privacy and security. And so it is fun to think about if I have all of my electronics, that if I'm wearing them on my shirt or if it, my cell phone, it just seems to... Um, stress the issue of how we're going to have electronic and information privacy as we have this ubiquitous electrical circuits everywhere. Have you thought about this in your work? This is definitely something we we have to think about. We are uh, working with data scientists uh, to address this issue. You're listening to The Future of Everything with Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Janen Bao from the Stanford University Department of Material Sciences. One of the things that we've talked about uh, and that I've read about is the possibility of healing of these materials. And that really blows my mind because, okay, I can see how we might be able to have electricity flexibly going through bendable materials. But I always have thought of healing as very much associated with life. You know, there are, at least in biological systems, which I'm more familiar with, there are cells, they sense the injury, they build a matrix of supporting materials upon which the other cells can then replace the skin or replace the bone. Tell me how we could ever think about non-living materials healing. We are also inspired by biological systems. Uh, That's why we start thinking about how we can make electronic materials that can self-heal themselves. So what if you uh, break your electronics or have scratches on your electronics? If we can have them self-repair, that would be wonderful. Uh, So the basic science that goes into it is um, basically to develop materials that Uh, carry chemical bonds that can uh, form very easily at room temperature or only slightly elevated temperature. Actually, we utilize chemical bonds that can be found in biological system because they uh, self-assemble, they they, uh, require very low energy for bond formation, and they enable us to uh, uh, allow the material to self-repair. But that means they must have some ability to remember what they're supposed to be doing. In other words, when you break it, then there's this, okay, I have to make it what it was before. Can you give us a sense for how would a system know what it was supposed to be doing after it's been broken? Mm. Like, how does it know which chemical bonds to form and which ones not to form? There are um, some a, a certain kind of material called shape memory ah. uh, material. Uh, so they have an equilibrium kind of uh, configuration that they tend to go into, but then the material can be fixed in a non-equilibrium state. So when they break, then they will, when they repair themselves, it it will go into this equilibrium state, uh, which is the the shape we want it to be. Ah, so to kind of summarize, Mm -hmm. it's like it snaps back to its memorized, kind of like a slinky Mm -hmm. when you pull the slinky and then you let go and it goes back to what it was before. Exactly, yeah. Okay, so now we have electricity flowing through our, our bendable plastics. They're going to heal themselves. How about for energy and solar power? Is this a, an area that where we could benefit from these kinds of technologies? As, you, as I'm sure you know very well better than me, and there is a huge need for new energy sources. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like, I'm not an expert, that these materials might be useful in the energy industry. Uh, yes, we found uh, applications in both uh, solar energy area as well as for energy storage for batteries. Uh, in the solar area, um, we're looking at solar solar cells that are um, can be code covering a very large area. For example, if you want to make a solar tent, then uh, you would be folding them um, uh, into smaller size. And when you go to all the places, you unfold them. So those um, uh, solar cells need to be flexible and stretchable. In the area of uh, battery, uh, lithium-ion batteries, uh, we found that the self-heating material, for example, we mentioned earlier, yes. actually can allow allow lithium-ion battery to um, uh, last longer and uh, have higher capacity. 
Does it affect the safety? Because most of us have been hearing about lithium batteries recently because they explode on airplanes. So there seems to be some safety issues there. Is this neutral for safety or might it be helpful? We have a temperature sensing material that we developed for the artificial skin. We actually oh. uh, applied it uh, uh, to make a battery to shut off on its own when the battery overheats. So uh, there are some possibilities to apply them as a, uh, I guess, health monitoring system for, for battery this instead is of for human beings. This is excellent. So we now have pressure, we have temperature. Has there Are there other... So as I, now I'm going to just go through my inventory of, uh, of human skin. How, how about... Um, Cold and heat. How how hard are those for sensing? Cold and heat. Uh, that that that's related to temperature. Yes. So that can be uh, detected. Yes, um, of course. Yeah, humidity uh, is uh, quite straightforward. Uh, so what we really want to do uh, next is to be able to sense uh, chemicals and uh, sense uh, biological species. So then that will allow us to use artificial skin to uh, truly monitor. Uh, the uh, health condition of a person and even detect disease. Yes, yeah, so this is exciting. And let, so let me ask, just to push it, since I'll, I'll get greedy now. So now we have these individual capabilities. Can they coexist in the same material? So now I'm imagining a rubbery or plasticky, bendable surface. And it, can it, is it possible that I can get all at everything that I can get the pressure sensation, the temperature sensation, um, the, perhaps the chemical sensation, will they coexist on the same materials? Uh, it's likely we have to use different materials. Uh, if we put all the requirements <laughs> on one material, then uh, the material may be, may be able to do it, but it may be a mediocre right. uh, material for each of the applications. So would it be like layering of some kind? Yeah, it could be layering. And uh, also the nice thing about these materials uh, because is that we can formulate them into paint. So we can uh, print them. We can use inkjet printing or 3D printing printing to print them uh, into uh, different locations on the artificial skin. Uh, so we can incorporate many different uh, sensors and electronics on, all onto the same skin. What about underneath the skin? Are there promises for um, these kinds of materials also improving our ability to replace functions below the skin? Certainly, um, the um, uh, similar materials design concept can be applied to um, uh, to add functionalities uh, to um, uh, tissue and to bones or regenerating um, organs. So, is the ability to do three D printing? Uh, and also you mentioned uh, inkjet printing, which kind of surprised me. These are serious technologies even for these kinds of applications? Um, 3D printing actually in particular has been uh, quite uh, widely used for uh, printing artificial organs uh, uh, these days. Uh, inkjet printing, uh, on the other hand, has been uh, um, uh, very intensely investigated for uh, the electronics uh, uh, fabrication, for future electronic fabrication. So maybe I didn't appreciate this, but it sounds like inkjet printers are uh, pretty high tech and pretty precise at the levels that you would need them for electronic circuits? Uh, yes, um, inkjet printing uh, can uh, get to feature size uh, as small uh, as uh, a few micron, um, one, one, one hundredth uh, of the width of human hair. It's not uh, the uh, smallest feature size that we're using for microprocessors, for computers, but for making artificial skin or flexible electronics, uh, this feature size is uh, sufficient. So you should have a new respect for your inkjet printer in your office. Definitely. Uh, I, um, what about the interface between these electronic materials that you're designing, which really sound amazing. They're going to have current running through them, controllable. They're going to have pressure and other sensation. What is the uh, challenges for getting that to talk to the human brain? So if I am using it as part of a prosthesis, how do I get my brain to be aware of what the material is sensing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we need to um, uh, engineer the artificial skin so that they can put out electrical signals that our uh, brain can understand. So that involves designing the um, uh, circuits 
to interface with the sensors to generate electrical pulses uh, that uh, our brain can understand. Uh, but also, we need to figure out how to send these electrical pulses uh, through the nerve system to get to our brain. Uh, that part still requires um, also a lot of further research. But the idea, just to make sure I understand, would be that some electrical wire at some point would be interfacing with a, with a human cell, either in a brain cell or perhaps a neuron cell from one of your nerves. And we would have to figure out how to speak the language of the human neuro, 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 neuronal system in order to transmit the information. Precisely. So that uh, is uh, startling to think about. Um, we are listening, and you are listening, to The Future of Everything with Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Dr. Jeanne Bao from uh, the Pro Department of Chemical Engineering, Material Science, and others at Stanford. We're talking about the future of electronics, uh, bendable cell phones, uh, bones that are printed, uh, skin that is printed by an inkjet printer. Um, my head is spinning. Uh, how did you decide to approach this research line? You have a PhD in chemistry. Uh, you worked at Bell Labs, a very famous laboratory for basic science. They invented lasers. They invented transistors. How did you wake up and say, this is what I'm going to work on? Um, I spent eight years in uh, Bell Labs uh, where uh, my research was mainly focusing on making cell phones bendable. So when I came to Stanford, I thought if I could make cell phones bendable, uh, then I should be able to make artificial skin uh, that also requires uh, the uh, electronics to be flexible. But not only that, we have a lot more new challenges we have to tackle. We have to make them stretchable, self-healable, and biodegradable, and be able to talk to skin, uh, talk to our brain. Uh, so uh, I was excited about these new challenges, uh, um, especially from the uh, material design aspect. So you must have to put together a team filled with different kinds of expertise. How do you how do you even make the decision about what kind of collaborators and students and what their expertise should be? Um, we, we have this long-term goal uh, on uh, what we would like to achieve. Uh, then while we develop our materials and devices, uh, we find what are the critical gaps we still have. And, and then uh, we come up with ideas to solve the problems. And uh, if there are missing uh, expertise, uh, um, missing uh, gaps, then we reach out to people who are the best in their field in that area. I would guess, just because as you know, I also work at Stanford, that when you teach these kinds of possibilities to young people, to the students, that they just have a zillion ideas about um, what they might be able to use this for. Um, how has the reaction to the research program been among students when you tell them about the work that you're doing? Um, my students, uh, they, they, they are uh, so creative and so excited about all the possibilities. Uh, uh, they, they enjoy watching science fiction, and uh, frequently they will come back to me and say, oh, I have this new idea. I can make uh, the Spider-Man work. I can uh, learn Spider-Man is the, my favorite. <laughs> uh, uh, from, from the Superman or Spider-Man, and, and then they come up with all the new ideas. Uh, so, for example, the self-healing aspect uh, came from uh, w uh, the students uh, watching the, uh, the Wolfman, I think. Ah. Yeah. So it's, it seems to me that the most important thing is not to tell them it's impossible. Yes. Um, then just let them uh, uh, try it. And they, they, they always make it work. So uh, the bendable cell phone, you mentioned that um, before, and you just mentioned it as one of the initial things you had been working on. Um, so I take it we're not talking about a little bit of a curve in the screen, which we've already seen. Um, could you just paint a little picture about how bendable this cell phone is going to be? Maybe describe it for us if mm -hmm. you can. Yeah. So um, if you uh, imagine our current phone is, um, uh, is about 5 millimeter in thickness, yes. uh, then the bendable phone would be 
um, say 2.5 millimeter or one millimeter in thickness. So half or uh, less. Half of the thickness, but then when you fold it, it will be about the same thickness as our current phone. So that that will be the early generation. And when you open it up, will it look like our current cell phones, or will it be very different in some way? It, it will look very similar for the uh, first generation. Will it feel hard, or will it feel like I'm pressing like a piece of rubber? It will be similar as the normal cell phone, but in the future, we hope that it will be a tiny piece you put into your pocket, then you take it out and stretch it into any size or shape you want. So you, earlier in our conversation, you were talking about um, that we could have clothing that's made out of the similar material, that it'll have electronic circuits. So I might imagine wearing a cell phone on my arm or as part of my shirt. Uh, yes, that's um, a, a prototype that's already possible to make. It's not full function of a cell phone, but uh, a display that's as thin as skin uh, on your arm. Probably we'll see that type of uh, prototype very soon. That uh, I think many of us who are listening to this are getting very excited about this because I'm all of a sudden my smartwatch seems very inadequate, and uh, I want more real estate and I want to see uh, m- more things. Um, so, so we've we've been talking to uh, Dr. Bao about the future of electronics. We've uh, heard about a new cell phone that's actually coming out. Sounds pretty soon. It'll be bendable, but it really will be just the tip of the iceberg of what's going to be coming out for uh, electronics. These will be interfaced with human systems eventually. Of course, there's a lot of research there about how to get that interface to work. But you can really imagine an exciting future. Um, How do you focus your efforts? So I'm sure that there are so many products you could build, but how do you also decide what's the important thing to happen at the university? Well, in the university, our goal is to um, uh, to to dream the future and uh, really working on things that are far out in the future and to train the next generation of uh, scientists and uh, engineers. Uh, so so we select problems that will have transformative impact, but it may not be something that will have a product immediately. But if we develop a new technology, we also look at what are the possible more near-term applications. Uh, And um, uh, uh, then if we have something that's really unique, uh, then we seek for possibilities uh, to uh, transfer the technology to make them useful for everybody. You have been listening to the Future of Everything podcast with Russ Altman. I want to remind you that the Future of Everything started out as a radio show on Sirius XM. So you'll hear references to that. Now it is a 100% podcast. We have more than 200 interviews in our archive, and they cover an extraordinary range of topics. If you're enjoying the podcast, please consider subscribing or following so that you can be alerted to every new episode and never be surprised by the future. Maybe tell your friends about it, too. Definitely consider rating and reviewing it. That helps us grow, improve, and also spreads the word. You can connect with me on Twitter at RB Altman and with Stanford Engineering at Stanford ENG.